they may look like a random box of miscellaneous shoes in various colors and sizes, but not to everyone. Each pair has the ability to create a story with a little imagination and guidance from Adrian Fogelin. These are props for her writing classes. Who wore these? Where were they running to? Where were they running from? I believe that kids, and adults too, learn to write better if they start with an object rather than a, a prompt like, write about an old guy. So let's look at this old guy. So I'd put those up in front of the kids, and I would, I would position them, okay. He's standing kind of tough. Okay, I want you to look at the rest of him. Let's take a look at his pants. Jeans, holes in the left knee maybe. He's got some stuff in his pockets. If you could empty his pockets and put the stuff on the table, what would you find? You're thinking a cigarette lighter, am I right? Little by little, we would build the character, the setting, and then we would say, okay, we need a plot. What do you think's going on in his life? Oh, I think he just lost his job. And little by little, we will have a story and we will know the character. The last thing we do is we name him because we kind of have to know more about him before we figure out what name he would answer to. So that's the way we build a character and a story, starting with a pair of boots. My mother always loved storytelling, always loved writing. My mother always thought that books kind of appeared in the universe that no real humans ever wrote a book. But then a mother of a friend of hers told her she was writing a book about being a nurse in World War I. And my mother thought, I know this woman. Maybe I could write it. Two. In fact, my mother wrote all the time. Um, these are these two books are books of hers that were published. This one by Simon and Schuster. This book was actually translated into many languages. My memory of growing up in that house was listening to the sound of my mother's typewriter upstairs. It was the music of my childhood. We'd say, "Hey, mom, I'm kind of hungry." She'd say, "Fix yourself something." Hey, mom. Chris is bleeding. Put a Band-Aid on it. Which taught me that there's so much joy in writing and you're so much in that other place that you kind of let your kids put the Band-Aid on. Um, my mother was a fabulous mother, but she was also a fabulous and dedicated writer. Could you take a moment and read from one of your books? Read a little bit and tell us what that means and where you're going with this story. The book I'm gonna read from is Crossing Jordan. And I was working on a completely different book when there was a knock on my door and it was my next door neighbor, Christina. And she said, guess what, Miss Adrian? We're gonna have to move soon because there are getting to be too many black people in this neighborhood. I said, well, what, what's wrong with that? She said, well, you know, they break in your house and they rob you and they shoot you. And I said, did that ever happen to anyone you know? And she said, no. I said, well, then what makes you think it's true? And she said, Everyone knows it's true. And it was coming from her parents, and they did move away. So as soon as she left, and after me trying to convince her that that was untrue, I began writing this book, Crossing Jordan. And I'm just gonna read you the opener. Chapter one, The Fence. Daddy held out his hand. Got another one of them nails, string bean? This fence is awful big, I said, handing him one. Good fences make good neighbors, he said, and he gave the nail a whack. Well, we won't even be able to see the new neighbors with this fence in the way. I pulled my hair back and lifted it to cool my neck. Summer is the worst time to build anything in a hot place like Tallahassee, Florida. But Daddy was determined to finish the fence before the new people moved in. They stay out of our business and we stay out of theirs, we'll get along fine, he said. The for sale sign on the house next door had hardly been up a week when Mama said, that she'd heard a black family had bought the old faircloth place. Daddy brought his fist down on the table and the supper plates jumped. Place is gonna go downhill, he said. I didn't know how much further downhill the place could go. The paint was all cracked and the flower beds were overgrown. Seemed like it was at the bottom of the hill already. I'll just have to build a fence, he said. Let's take a step in other directions. Talk about your singing. How did you get involved in singing and the hot tamale? Where I come from, the dogs don't bite. And 
I have sung for a very long time. When I first took up guitar, I went to take lessons, and the man I took lessons from, we started singing something, and he said, wait a minute, you can sing. I have a group of guys, I think you need to sing with them. And that kind of began me as someone who um, sang, okay, here's, this is me in a group called Half Price Paradise. That was the first rock band I was in. This is me with my first, uh, Craig is my fourth duo singer. So I've, I've done a lot of singing with a guy always, in college, after that. And as for Craig, I had pretty much stopped singing when we moved to Tallahassee from the Keys. And I was helping a friend sell stuff at the downtown market, her pottery. And this guy would come and he would just busk, he would just play. And I kept thinking, he needs harmony. So finally one day I just said, would you mind if I just added some harmony? And after that, every Saturday when he came, we'd start singing and then he said, should we practice? And then we started practicing and we've been playing together now for 11, 12 years, something like that. You know, let's play uh, this song, Grandpa Had a Dance Band, okay. uh, about your grandpa, but uh, let's make sure that we start with the right tempo so we don't get okay. too fast together. with something happening in the world and I turn it into a song. Like, I'm generally the seed starter for our community garden. I start the seed and then we put them in the garden. The okra song came out of watering on a, like a 95 degree day and I started feeling like, darn it, I'm out here, it's like 9,000 degrees. And I began writing, the okra don't grow if the water don't flow. You know the okra don't grow if the water don't grow. We have one song that I wrote you every time. about the woman at the movie theater who sells you the tickets. I'm always curious about the people that no one notices. I have a couple songs about being buskers, which is what you are when you stand on the sidewalk with your guitar. I have one called Busker's Lament, Could have gone far. which is about two old guys sitting by the door of the Greyhound station playing their music and he's saying, you know, we could have been something, but we're okay. You and me play the old songs all day. We're out here, you know, we can split a lunch, people put money in the case, our kids are a little embarrassed, but we're okay. In my books and in my music, I really tell the stories that don't get told. That's my mission. Why Tallahassee? Why have you stayed here? And what does Tallahassee mean to you? Tallahassee has the most beautiful trees I've ever seen. The live oaks. The live oaks are kind of typical of what's beautiful about Tallahassee. It's a natural environment. When my father moved here after my mother's death, he loved that the pace of life here was so much more comfortable. And that, frankly, is a big part of what I love about being here. It's just so nice and warm and friendly. Robert Johnson's song that gave us the name of our band, Hot Demise. Hot Demise in the bed, I hope she's got him say. Hot Demise in the bed, I hope she's got him say. We got shakers for the kids. I got a little she's long and tall. Go ahead. She's in the kitchen with a big love on. Hot Demise in the bed, I hope she's got him say. I do. Yes, she's got to say. Yes, she's really got to